So how do attackers hack into industrial control environments or our ICS OT networks? This can be a hard question to answer if you're new to the field or even if you've been around forever and a day, right? We should understand those ways, the common ways that attackers break in so we can best defend against those methods that the attackers use. And so if I have a power plant, right, how are attackers going to be able to break into that ICSOT network that we use to run the power plant? In this case, the number one way is attackers will come in through your back office or IT. Remember that in control system environments, you'll have like the power plant, you have connectivity with the IT network. And the IT network or the back office is where we send data from the power plant so that the business has access to that information, like how much electricity did we generate? Or how much water, how much natural gas did we use to generate that electricity at this plant? Right. The business needs all that information to be able to function, right? to be able to make sure we get paid and, and everybody has a job. Unfortunately, when you talk about the IT environment and the back office, that's where our employees are sitting there doing their job. And they're sitting there and they're browsing the Internet and they're reading email from their computers. So they're doing things like potentially going to sites that have malware hosted on them. Or what if they're clicking on the wrong link or opening up a malicious attachment in email and infecting their system? Once that user in the back office or the IT environment is compromised, then the attacker has that foothold in the IT environment and then they can use that to move into not only the rest of the IT network, but they can move into the OT network. So that's the number one way that attackers move from IT to, to OT. So we want to make sure we put up controls that help limit the risk there, like putting a firewall between IT and, and OT or multiple layers. We create an IT OT DMZ. Well, what are some other ways? When you look at that power plant, the power plant is maintained by team members we can think like engineers and technicians that are moving in and out of the facility and, and making sure that all the equipment is running optimally. And to do that, right, they have laptops, they have tablets and, and other devices. Maybe they're using their smartphone. Not that we want them to. But the idea is that, especially with those laptops and those tablets, those are staying there at the facility. They should never leave to where they might be compromised if somebody was using them, let's say, at home to, to just browse the open Internet. So those laptops and those tablets that we use to maintain the power plant, they stay on site. But you can have people bring in other types of devices or what we call transitory cyber assets. And so what if you have a, a consultant from an outside company come in and they bring their own laptop? The security of that device really is out of your control. So if they're compromised and they bring in their laptop that's infected and they hook it into your network, now that infection or that compromise with the attacker sitting there on their laptop essentially is now on your network. So it can be brought in by, by outside parties like consultants or contractors may be coming in to do an upgrade on for the facility. Somebody can bring in a, a USB drive to plug in. So if you're not blocking those USB ports, or even we mentioned, what about employees with smartphones? That maybe they just think they're going to hook up their, their phone to the USB drive in one of the maybe Windows systems that you have in the power plant, thinking they just need to charge it. But what if that, phone itself is compromised not only is it compromised but it has a, a cell connection out that could potentially give an attacker another way inside the facility so we can have attackers come from it we can have them bring in those compromises on infected systems or usb drives 
What about the internet? We talk about plants and ICS OT networks shouldn't be connected directly to the internet, but that's changing. Most environments, if you're outside of the nuclear realm, they don't worry about what we call the air gap, right? Where we're not connected to the internet necessarily or any other network like the IT network. So you can have now systems in OT that are connected to the cloud for things like monitoring. I want to be able to watch how my facility is performing from over the internet, or I want to send data up to the cloud where we can have huge computer farms with all the power to crunch these vast amounts of numbers to understand how to do things like predictive analytics. So I can make sure, ooh, that motor I have sitting over in a corner of a power plant, I need to go ahead and make sure that's changed out within the next two weeks before it fails. So there are definitely advantages of having cloud connectivity. The problem is any cloud environment is going to be compromised one day. So we have to be prepared for when it happens. We also see what happens if we have ICS or OT assets in the plant that somebody accidentally exposes directly to the internet. And we see those types of assets through Shodan. Attackers will find those assets and they will attack them whether it's something like a PLC or an HMI right, a screen that we use to control the, the PLCs or those programmable logic controllers that we use to then control things out in the real world. Or maybe it's just a CCTV camera that you have, but it's still sitting on the same network as all those other OT assets. If those are exposed to the internet, the attackers will find them and they will take control over them and they'll use them as a foothold on your OT network. You can also have, we always say, disgruntled employees or just employees. They don't even have to be the disgruntled, upset, or mad type because employees make mistakes, right? We do click on links and emails that we shouldn't. Maybe we get a phone call and we provide somebody over the phone with too much sensitive information. And the list can go on and on. Right? What about an engineer that understands how the power plant works and understands those processes intimately? And they would be the perfect person if they wanted to understand how to take that plant down or to create a condition to create something like an explosion. They're the perfect person to do that. So we have to be aware there is that employee component from a couple of different angles to think about. What if they just, again, maybe they bring in their smartphone and they plug it into to that USB port that they just want to charge their phone, not realizing that it's compromised. We talk about supply chain. So sometimes those compromises can be brought in, not just by an outside provider. I kind of throw that in a supply chain bucket. But if, what if we bought a piece of equipment and it's already compromised? There was evidence where we saw recently in the United States where we had port cranes right, used to, to take containers on and off of ships. And those cranes had cellular modems that were built into them for remote control, even though we weren't aware of that type of access. That would be a supply chain attack, right? We're purchasing new assets or equipment to put in the environment and it's already compromised in in some way shape or form or what if i brought in a you know i bought a, a new engineering workstation which is just a windows laptop and when i bought it it was infected right that would still be a supply chain attack we also think about and this i use to represent a couple of different things so one primarily i think of remote access because most OT or control system networks today allow remote access. That's required by vendors or consultants. They don't want their, their people coming on site to do upgrades if they don't have to. And honestly, the nice thing about that is it's safer as well. If I don't have somebody in the plant, they're not going to physically get hurt. So we want to allow remote access, but we have to do it securely. 
not only our state adversaries, but attackers like ransomware groups, right? They're looking for remote access into these types of environments and looking, can they exploit that VPN device? Or what if they steal the remote access credentials from one of your vendors or consultants? And maybe you're not using things like multi-factor authentication. That's another way that attackers can get into the environment. And I also look at this as, as another way. What if somebody plants a device on your network without your knowledge? And th believe it or not, this happens all the time. And this has actually even happened in nuclear facilities where you have a consultant coming in. They said, oh, we just need to run this connection back to our office or I needed this connection so I can be able to get to this system over the Internet so I can monitor and, and maintain the asset, even though again, they never ask permission or authorization, they never tell you about it. And you find these devices that are connected to your, your systems in the OT network over time, where, again, it's the consultant, the contractor, they don't necessarily mean anything by it, they're not thinking, they're not aware of the dangers, but at the same time, they're putting the entire facility at risk by doing this. So it's another one of those things that we have to keep an eye out for, and we have to monitor for these rogue signals in the environment. And there's a lot of other different ways that an attacker can break into an ICS OT environment as well. And we continue to see new types of tactics, techniques, and procedures come out. But this gives you an idea at a high level of the main ways that attackers break in or hack into ICS OT environments. So thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate it. I'll see you in the next one.